environmental conditions. And as you know, Amoncus contortus primary is uh, a parasite from uh, um, tropical, subtropical diseases, so subtropical countries. And Teladorsagia circumcincta is well adapted to cold uh, climates. For example, if you are working in Scotland, um, most of the uh, gastrointestinal strongitis in uh, uh, Scottish blackface in, uh, near Edinburgh uh, is Teladorsagia circumcincta. Um, I remember in uh, Monasty, in south of uh, Sardinia, uh, you have a moncus contortus when uh, the pastures are irrigated with hot climate, there is a kind of explosion of uh, moncus. So, if you want to um, conduct larval culture of all species, you have to uh, choose a temperature of incubation. And <laughs> that is the first difficulty <laughs> because <of> what? <laughs> what is this uh, best, best, the best compromise? Do you uh, um, and the, yes. yes. Mm. Everybody is uh, agree with, with that. Yeah. I think that uh, <coughs> What we what we are doing 24. I have, for for example in in Toulouse, I had a room um, in the middle of the uh, the superficie of this room is in, is in the middle of uh, this room, and uh, uh, the temperature is controlled with 24 degrees plus or minus one degrees. We are uh, using a very simple larval culture methodology because our purpose is to make plenty and plenty of larval culture not only one or two per week but uh, sometimes uh, 20 or 30 or 40 larval culture in the same time in the same room so it's uh, it's not possible to manage this number of larval culture with um, a time-consuming technique uh, or a very difficult technique to, uh, to manage. So we take one little bottle like this in plastic, we put about uh, between 50 and uh, 100 uh, grams of uh, uh, fecal materials. Um, every day we are giving some uh, humidity in this uh, bottle. Um, the time of culture is 10 to 12 days and before this uh, time uh, you have the uh, recovery, the extraction of uh, infective larvae you obtain here and we use a very simple method to, to do that because we full this bottle with water, we take uh, the, the bottle in, in this direction mm -hmm. and we collect larvae after 24 hours or 48 hours uh, they are moving by gravity, they are concentrating here and they are patting here and um, they are accumulating here in, uh, in this liquid. Then we are taking this liquid at 40, uh, 24 hours and 48 hours. We collect about uh, 40 milliliters of larval suspension by this way. And uh, because this larval solid suspension is too diluted, uh, we um, this step uh, of uh, recovery is followed by a step of concentration by centrifugation, 10 minutes at 2,500 uh, RPM, and then a final a final volume of 5 ml is uh, stored and stocked 
at four degrees four at all times and you can also conserve your infective larvae for months and months. I have some infective larvae uh, since two years uh, in, 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 my, in my lab. And uh, last week I tried to, uh, oh, some of them were still alive in two years and a half. This is uh, the simplified method proposed by the British um, uh, Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, etc. Et of course, uh, my colleague Hervé, probably some of, the, of you are knowing Hervé, is, uh, he prefers to, uh, to conduct uh, uh, the larval recovery by Berman apparatus. Um, what is the difference between the two methods? Probably uh, this method is um, more uh, sensitive. It's uh, probably uh, uh, the recovery rate is a little bit higher. But uh, compared with the, the time <coughs> you have to, to, to do the Berman, etc., this method is really. Um, in my opinion, is, is easy to, to use. But there are, there are some uh, personal observations about this uh, recovery rates. And year by year, uh, we observe that these uh, recovery rates are higher when larval culture are started as soon as the fecal material is sampled. Because um, in Toulouse, I have uh, some experimentally infected animals that are very close to my lab, 200 meters. I take some uh, fecal materials from these animals, and then I, um, I am doing. I start the larval culture immediately, and the recovery rate is between 30 and 50, sometimes 60 percent of eggs are producing larvae. But sometimes I have, um, I receive some fecal material um, after one day or two days, sometimes three days after uh, the collection on animals. And I observe that these uh, larval cultures when not as efficient as uh, the uh, larval culture conducted with fresh material. I don't know why. Uh, it could be due to uh, external uh, um, conditions, temperature, or, uh, during the transportation of these uh, pieces. So, and sometimes uh, I can observe a lot of eggs. I am doing larval culture, but the recovery rate is low. When we uh, receive fecal material in Toulouse, um, the first step is not to analyze the EPG, but the first step is to start the larval culture, to, uh, to be sure that the, uh, uh, the time between the collection of fecal material and the start of the larval culture is as short as possible. The recovery rate of larval culture could depend on the capacity of eggs to uh, develop into infected larvae. And I observe, um, because I have um, uh, experimentally animals in, uh, in Toulouse, um, I observe that during an experimental infection, the recovery rate of larval culture was higher at the beginning of the infection with Amoncus contorius, and after two, uh, two months, uh, six weeks, two months, the um, capacity of eggs to develop to infective larvae tends to diminish. So it means that for, for um, a sample coming from a farm, we don't know. Um, uh, the age of the infection. <coughs> and sometimes you can have some surprises. And probably 
Um, during winter, when animals are kept indoors, um, you are sampling these animals, and uh, sometimes the recovery rate of uh, larval culture could be low. So, how to identify infective larvae? The second step. Hmm. It's not really. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, everybody here has done hydromorphological <laughs> identification, I presume. Mm -hmm. And you know that uh, you are uh, looking at the presence of absence of uh, the sheet here, uh, the number of intestinal cells, uh, the, the shape of the, uh, these intestinal cells, the length of uh, the virus uh, in the anterior part of the... Um, okay. And then you have um, different um, parameters which are really important to uh, identify this uh, larvae. Um, for example, you have here what we are calling the she's tail extension. So this here and with higher magnification, okay. Here you have this extension of sheaths. Yeah. Um, you know that for uh, in the keys of identification, uh, this parameter is probably one of the most important. And uh, sometimes it's really easy to see long, very long uh, tail uh, extension, and sometimes. It's not so easy. For example, here um, you have three pictures of an ungus, Trichospongylus um, circumcinta, Trichospongylus colubriformis. These larvae are coming from uh, pure strains of these parasites. Pure strains of an ungus, Teladosagia trichospongylus. And now we are looking at the end here. Of this. Um... <coughs> so, here, number one, Hemonchus mm -hmm. contortus, okay, everybody is okay, I think. Yeah. But it could be Coperia. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Hemonchus or Coperia. Yeah. Of course, yeah, this, is, uh, this larva is coming for a pure strain of Hemonchus, so probably it's Hemonchus. Yeah. <laughs> but in the field, it <coughs> could, could, could be. Uh, yeah. uh, among us, or uh, look at here, you have the tail extension of Teladorsagia circumcincta, and here the tail extension of Trichostrongylus colubriformis, coming from pure strains. And it's a very short tail extension. Could be Trichospongylus, but here you have uh, a longer tail extension in this one, Teladorsagia circumcincta. When you are working with um, uh, field populations, not experimental experimental strains like this, um, sometimes I am, I am on the microscope, I see the tail extension, and obviously and honestly, I cannot be sure to say this is Teladorsagia, this is Trichotongius. Um, when you are regarding the, um, the keys, for example, I, I think that you know this uh, key identification from uh, Van Dyck and Mayhew. Uh, um, they propose to, uh, to distinguish. <laughs> <laughs> from Telador Sagia circumcinta by the, uh, yes. Yes. some parameter in the anterior yeah. uh, end of uh, the larvae, with here a kind of shoulder for Telador Sagia and no shoulder for Trichostrongyus. Maybe it's, it's, it's not, not easy. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that one. People here. Uh, for example, here, um, I'm, you have the, the length of larvae. For example, um, 
Teladorsagia circumcincta and Tricospongius colubriformis, where um, yeah. we agree that uh, the tail extension yes. difference is very yeah. minimal. Very very yeah. yeah. um, presence of shoulder here compared to it's uh, like this. So, but um, there is a difference of size. Yeah. I think that it could be uh, a parameter. But of course, you have to measure the, mm -hmm. the larvae, you have to uh, put in ice uh, the, 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 some criteria of the larvae. Okay. Uh, difference between Amoncus and Coperia curtisi by the presence of uh, refringent bodies at the anterior end. Yes. I agree with uh, Coperia oncophora for cattle. I agree with Coperia um, pectinata and pentata from uh, tropical countries, but Coperia curtisi. Are you, are you sure to see the refringent bodies at the anterior no. end here? No, no, no. no. Me and, and I think that there is a big difference between uh, Coperia oncophora and Coperia curtisi. Uh, and I've, before working in Toulouse, I work in Africa. In, in Africa, Coperia curtisi is not present. It's Coperia pentata and Coperia pectinata. And for these two tropical diseases, uh, the um, refringent bodies at the anterior were easily distinguishable. But it was very clear. Like uh, uh, two refringent bodies, two? <laughs> no eyes. <laughs> so I came in France, I come back to, to, to France uh, with uh, Coperia curtisi. I look at uh, the. try to find the uh, refringent bodies. So, issues is between Amoncus contortus and Coperia, issues is between Teladorsagia and uh, Trichospongius colubriformis. Of course, I think that everybody is agree with uh, the fact that for uh, Oesophagostomum and Chabersia, the tail extension is very long. Is it important to distinguish this one and this one with infective larvae could be, but it's not uh, very. Uh, it's not the main issue. Okay, so um, this is uh, the key of uh, Van Dyck and Mayhew. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, well, I. I think it's uh, it's not very easy to, to use. So um, my personal feelings uh, is that three categories are easily uh, could be distinguished easily. Emoncus contortus, Coperia curtisei, Teladorsagia tricospongius, Osophagostomum chaversi. And the problem now is to separate uh, these species. And this is um, the, the, the key, morphological key we are using in, in Toulouse. Uh, I, I wrote it's probably not the best. <laughs> but uh, um, absence of, uh, she's of, okay, Spongioides uh, papillosus. She's very, um, very short, Teladorsagia. Or trichospongius, uh, medium size of tail extension, Emoncus contortus and Coperia curtisei, but we said that presence of uh, refringent bodies was not very easy to, to see, and uh, long tail extension is Oesophagostomum chavez. So, what we are doing that with uh, morphology, and to go further, we are using molecular tools. It's what I, I want to, to share with you now. It's a molecular approach. Five or six years ago, some papers um, were publicated. Some of them from the Australian group here, uh, published in Veterinary Parasitology. They proposed a molecular approach 
for the identification of the main uh, trichotsongi species of sheep and they propose um, a Pac-Man technology for that and they propose also uh, some primers, specific primers and probes uh, for each of the main species of gastrointestinal animals in sheep. So, uh, these probes and, um, and primers are designed in the internal uh, space uh, two uh, region of the uh, air and and um, we used, uh, in the first time, we used the primers and the um, uh, probes proposed by this publication, by uh, McNally, uh, Johnny McNally, in Australia. And we got some problems with these um, primers and probes because uh, they showed poor specificity with our gastrointestinal nematode species. I would like just to, to give you um, a view of that. So, here you have DNA. Uh, the DNA used. Remember, we have uh, pure strains of the Moncus contortus, Teladorsagia, Precostrangius. So, we extract DNA from these uh, pure strains. Okay? We, you have uh, forward primers, specific forward primers, and specific probes, Emoncus, uh, Teladorsagia, and Precostrangius probes. If you have uh, the accurate, the, the right uh, combination, DNA from Emoncus contortus, uh, forward primer with Emoncus contortus, first primer is common to all species. So, of course, you have amplification. You have amplification with uh, DNA of Teladorsagia, forward primer of Teladorsagia, and uh, specific Teladorsagia probe amplification, amplification for O. That's good. But the problem is that we got some amplification with uh, Emoncus contortus DNA, forward primers of <laughs> Teladorsagia circumcinta, and Emoncus contortus probe. So it means that uh, this uh, forward primer of Teladorsagia circumcinta could bind with DNA of Emoncus contortus. And the same thing with uh, the forward primer of Trichosongius, we could bind to a Moncus contactus to give false, uh, false reactions. So we, um, we try to, uh, to manage that by using um, another technology for uh, forward primers. And this is um, explained in this paper published in 2017. Um, the first album was my uh, Master 2 student and during a, a, a stage he developed uh, a new approach and this new approach is to, uh, to try to uh, improve the specificity of forward primers uh, of this PCR and to, to get this um, high specificity of forward primers, we use LNA um, nucleotides, some modified nucleotides by LNA uh, technology. And this LNA technology, just to, um, to give you an example here, uh, you, I don't know the, uh, it's a methylene bridge between uh, two carbon here, and this render um, very stable um, <coughs> forward primer uh, build with this LNA uh, technology um, could avoid the non-specific bindings on uh, foreign uh, DNAs. So, we, um, we developed new um, forward primers compared to uh, McNally. We uh, kept 
the probes and the reverse uh, primer from uh, McNally. And we substitute only the, uh, this Elena um, forward primers to the forward primers of uh, McNally. And we try to, um, to test the specificity of uh, these new uh, primers on DNA extracted directly from worms. So we, we, we go to, uh, to the slaughterhouse. Sometimes in parasitology, we think it's very important to, to come back to, to the slaughterhouse to, to get worms, adult worms, to be sure that you have And we, we got some uh, Amoncus contortus worms, uh, male and female, Stella dorsagia, Tricospongius, Coperia, Nematovirus, Osophagostomum, Venulosum. And we testing uh, our tools, the new forward primers with uh, the probes and the reverse uh, primer from McNally. And uh, we got here uh, high specificity, except for uh, Oesophagostomum venulosum, where we got a very weak signal uh, across here. Um, amplification, but very weak compared to, uh, to, the, to the specific uh, combination. So, now, what we are doing, because we, we had um, pure strains of different uh, species, we, um, we built standard curves established from dilution of uh, DNA of uh, 100 uh, uh, larvae. And we got this kind of standard curve. It's a log of number of Amoncus contortus larvae equivalent to the amount of uh, DNA in the mixture and the efficacy of uh, this uh, PCR is about uh, 100 percent and by this way it's possible to uh, um, you are starting with uh, a CQ uh, for example 20 here and you can extrapolate the number of uh, larvae present in your uh, larval suspension. Okay. And we, we are doing that with Semoncus, with Stella dorsagia and Tricostrongius, probably from this. Of course, for each PCR plate, we have to, uh, uh, to have these standard curves. It's not possible to extrapolate from one day to another, from one plate to another plate. So uh, it means that a part of the the plate is dedicated, obligatory, mandatory, or dedicated to this uh, standard curve because, of course, for each PCR reaction, uh, you have some small difference. Okay, and here you have uh, just uh, an application of this molecular tool in uh, natural infection. This uh, this also. Uh, the results of uh, morphological identification. I got a larval culture with a suspension of different species. Um, with my key of morphological identification, I um, evaluate the proportion of different uh, species in my larval uh, suspension. So most of them here, uh, Emuncus here, um, Tricosongeus, uh, and Teladon Sagia, 64%, 4% of Strongyloides papillosus, and very few Oesophagostomum uh, venulosum here. Now, we uh, compare with uh, molecular identification, of course, because I have no uh, specific primers and probes for, at this moment, for Oesophagostomum and Strongyloides, they disappeared in uh, the left part of my uh, my slide, but I'm uh, by molecular um, um, identification, I can say that here in my block Teladorsagia tricospongius, in fact, the most important uh, species is Teladorsagia with a few uh, tricospongius in the proportion of. Uh, Amoncus, you know, 
not so bad for the for the collection application. In in this work, um, we try to uh, evaluate the correlation between the number of L infective larvae evaluated by counting on microscope and evaluated by real-time PCR. And as you can see here, the correlation is very high. So it means that um, evaluation, the evaluation of a number of uh, larvae by microscope and by uh, this real-time PCR is uh, quite similar. It's not, there is no big difference. Um, just to say that these molecular tools um, permit the, the identification and the semi quantification of infective larvae of the three main gastrointestinal species of small ruminants. And these molecular tools <coughs> could be applied for field uh, studies, for example, epidemiological studies or alternative resistance surveys. For example, here it's um, a work done in a meat sheep farm in Limousin. And so the Limousin is a, a center of France. Um, and in this farm, there was a suspicion of uh, levamisole resistance. Okay? So we went to this farm where at D0 we collect. Um, fecal material from 12 um, use. We uh, uh, conduct a, a pool larval culture from these 12 uh, and uh, these 12 um, use were treated with uh, levamisole. We came back uh, 14 days later and we compared the proportion of uh, the different species before and after treatment with uh, levamisole. So it appeared by this way that Emoncus mototus is quite susceptible to uh, levamisole, but of course you have um, two species, Teladorsagia here and Tricosongius. As you can see, the proportion of the Tricosongius increased uh, between the two. Um, two sampling periods and the conclusion is that uh, in this form two species Teladorsagia circumcinta or Trichosrongius uh, and sorry I didn't give you this uh, information Trichosrongius in these molecular tools are able to detect all Trichosrongius species polymorphism and axi so it means that uh, Trichosongius and Teladorsagia are probably resistant to uh, Levamisole in this form. Uh, this tool was also uh, used to uh, confirm that um, um, the popu uh, contortus population was, was resistant to ivermectin and benzimidazole in, in some flock in the, in the south of France. And in this work, of course, uh, morphology and uh, molecular identifications are exactly similar. And finally, I would like to, to speak about uh, epidemiological studies. Um, a work we conduct in uh, this part of France, in the uh, Aveyron Département. Uh, which is a uh, very famous uh, department in the south of France because uh, in this place we have, uh, of course, less dairy sheep than in Sardinia, but uh, 800 uh, and uh, 50,000 dairy sheep on black on green with the production of Rockford. And we, we try just to um, evaluate the proportion of different species in different farms uh, distributed uh, in this department. For example, here in this farm, at that time, for the, the animal collected at, at that time, the most important species was a mongoose. Here it was Stella Here it was uh, uh, 
um, three species were well represented, etc. So it means that um, by, with this molecular tool, we can have an, um, an overview of uh, the difference between uh, farms, uh, could be also difference between, uh, um, I don't know, could be mountainous uh, areas versus plain uh, areas, etc. Et and uh, to finish, I would like to, um, to show you another example of application of this molecular tool. In um, this department, um, <coughs> it's um, a department where we, we, we have a lot of meat sheep. Um, there is an experimental farm where we evaluate the element of fauna. Um, we, have, we compare the amount of fauna between two types of grazing uh, management, a self-grazing and a traditional rotational grazing. Here you can see a picture of these uh, animals under the self-grazing system. It means that they, they, there are plenty and plenty of uh, use for uh, a short time, 24 hours, and on a limit, very small uh, superficie, very small pasture. And after 24 hours, they are moving to another one. And in this work, we compare uh, the cell grazing here with the traditional rotational grazing system, which uh, okay, uh, used in the traditional rotational grazing system are staying seven or eight or ten days in the same pasture. And what on the difference of uh, elementofauna between these two systems and this could be an example for example here um, you have um, in uh, October um, 18 you, you have um, the proportion of species in uh, cell grazing system and in uh, traditional rotational system here you have the proportion of the different species. So, this molecular tool uh, could, be, could evaluate the difference of elementofauna and the evolution, uh, the seasonal evolution of uh, uh, elementofauna in the same form. You can compare elementofauna between farms, you can evaluate the seasonal. Uh, uh, evolution of elemental of fauna uh, in the same form this time. Uh, some application. And of course, there are other tools, and it's my last slide, and especially for Alexandra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, in, uh, in a few months, two months, you are starting a stay in, uh, in Ghent. In Ghent. Yeah. And if my information is uh, correct, uh, Ghent and the Morudun uh, Institute in Edinburgh, they are using the new technology uh, from the uh, host diagnostics. And this is uh, a kind of robot mm -hmm. uh, of a PCR and for the, the identi rapid identification of uh, all these uh, Telatoxagia, Precostrongius, Emoncus, Coperia, Pan Coperia, it means Coperia uh, could be Oncophora, Cutisei, mm -hmm. Pecunata, etc. Uh, Pan Ozophagostomum, it means could be uh, Venulosum, or Columbianum in uh, tropical countries, um, Chabersia, and the Pan Nematode, uh, also Primus and, and Probes, to, okay, to, to have a uh, an overview of uh, the gastrointestinal, all the species in, in this sample. Alors, I discussed with Florian Robert, where, who is a guy uh, working on, in house diagnostic, who is uh, uh, installing different uh, robots in, in different places in the world, and I discussed with him, he, he was uh, doing uh, the WAADP in Liverpool in 2015, and he told me this information is uh, 
been uh, from 2015, but the, the, the robot cost is about 45,000 euros to, to stand the machine.